Welcome to the Deep Dive. We're your shortcut to getting really informed, you know, without drowning in information. Today, we're diving deep, really deep, into the world of molecular and cellular biology. Think of it as uh, peeling back the layers of life itself, from the tiniest molecules right up to the complex stuff happening inside every single one of your cells. Our mission. To unpack the essentials from the latest molecular biology of the cell, we want to distill these, well, often complex ideas into something clear and memorable for you. Okay, let's unpack this. Absolutely. And the goal here is really to translate that technical jargon, make it understandable. We want to connect it all back to how your own body works and you know what it means for research today. Make this microscopic universe feel, well, relatable mm. and ho hopefully pretty exciting too. I love that. Okay, so let's kick things off with the cell itself. I mean, it's the basic building block, right? And it's just incredibly organized from that outer layer protecting it to all the machinery buzzing inside. It really is. That outermost boundary, the plasma membrane, it's dynamic, like a very sophisticated skin. Yep. It's mainly built from a lipid bilayer. Oh. Uh, imagine two layers of oily molecules forming this flexible barrier. And embedded in there, you have all sorts of membrane proteins. They act as, well, gatekeepers, sensors letting specific things in and out. Eat keepers, you like that. Yeah, and on the outside, there's also this delicate carbohydrate layer, the glycocalyx. It's super important for cells recognizing each other. Think of it like a cell's ID tag. Okay, so once you get past this, this boundary, what's inside? Is it just a soup of molecules? Oh, far from it. Inside, it's incredibly organized with these specialized compartments called organelles. Each one has a specific job, kind of like different departments in a city. You've got the endoplasmic reticulum or ER. There's a rough part and a smooth part. The rough ER is like a protein factory studded with ribosomes making proteins. The smooth ER, more involved in lipids and detoxification. Okay, a factory, what else? Then there's the Golgi apparatus. Think of it as the cell's post office. It receives proteins from the ER, modifies them, sorts them, sends them off. And of course, the mitochondria. You probably heard of them. The powerhouses. Right? Exactly, the powerhouses, generating most of the cell's energy. Then you have lysosomes, which are like the recycling centers breaking down waste. And centrally, there's the nucleus. That's the control center, housing the chromosomes, the genetic blueprint. The nucleus, yeah, the brain of the operation. How does it manage all that information, keep things flowing correctly? Right, the nucleus is key. And getting things in and out is tightly controlled by these things called nuclear pore complexes, or NPCs. They're like selective bouncers at the door. Yeah. Very specific about what passes. Inside, of course, is the DNA, that famous double helix structure. Yeah. And at the very ends of the chromosomes, you find these protective caps called telomeres. Telomeres, like the plastic tips on shoelaces. That's a great analogy. They prevent the DNA ends from fraying each time a cell divides. And there's an enzyme, telomerase, that helps maintain them, adding back those little caps. It solves a tricky issue called the end replication problem. Incredible detail. So we have these compartments, but what about the actual workers, the molecules doing the jobs? I guess that's where proteins come in. Exactly. Now we get to the molecular superstars. Proteins, they do almost everything. And their function comes down to their incredible ability to fold into very specific 3D shapes. If the folding's wrong, the protein just doesn't work. Proteins often have these distinct functional units uh, called protein domains, little modules within the protein. Okay, domains. And here's where it gets really cool. Allostery. It's a fundamental concept. Imagine a protein machine. Allostery means a small change in one part. Maybe a molecule binds somewhere, can cause a ripple effect, changing the protein's activity somewhere else entirely. So like a r remote control for the protein's function. Precisely. It allows cells to quickly switch things on or off, it makes life incredibly responsive. So proteins aren't just static things, they're dynamic. Do they actually move stuff around? Oh, absolutely. Think about motor proteins, mm. like myosin and dynin. They literally walk along tracks within the cell carrying cargo organelles, vesicles, you name it. And the tracks themselves, part of the cytoskeleton, things like actin filaments and microtubules, they're super dynamic too. How so? Well, microtubules, for instance, show dynamic instability. They rapidly grow and then suddenly shrink back. It's like they're searching space, which is vital for things like pulling chromosomes apart during cell division. Actin filaments can do something called treadmilling. Subunits add on one end and fall off the other, creating this sort of molecular conveyor belt effect. A conveyor belt. That's a great picture. Okay, moving on. How do cells manage traffic? 
getting things in and out and generating the energy for all this activity, it must be constant. It's nonstop. Membrane transport is fundamental. You've got ion channels, which are like simple gates. They open and close really fast for specific ions, think nerve impulses. Then there are pumps, like the famous NAB plus BASK plus pump, or CAN2 plus pumps. These use energy, usually from ATP, to actively push ions against their concentration gradient like pushing water uphill. Requires energy, right? Definitely. And then you have transporters. Some move two things together, symporters. Others swap things across the membrane antiporters, like molecular turnstiles. And besides moving small stuff, cells also use vesicles, these little membrane packages. Exactly. Vesicular transport. This mm -hmm. includes endocytosis, which is mm -hmm. the cell taking material in. Sometimes it's like drinking fluid, sometimes eating larger particles. Mm -hmm. That eating part, phagocytosis, is a big deal for immune cells, like macrophages and neutrophils. They engulf bacteria debris. Wow, so they literally eat invaders. They do. And the opposite is exocytosis, where cells release stuff like hormones or signaling molecules packaged in vesicles. Material taken in by endocytosis often goes through compartments called endosomes on its way to the lysosomes, those recycling centers, for wow. breakdown. It's a whole internal trafficking system. A cellular postal service almost. Okay, with all this action, how is it all powered? What about the energy? Right, energy. The main currency is ATP adenosine triphosphate. And the primary way most cells make ATP is through a process called chemiosmotic coupling. It's really elegant. Chemiosmotic coupling sounds complex. It sounds, it, but the concept is like a hydroelectric dam. Cells pump protons across a membrane, building up a high concentration on one side. That's the electrochemical proton gradient, like water stored behind the dam. Then these protons flow back across the membrane through a molecular machine, an enzyme called ATP synthase, which acts like a turbine. As the protons flow through, it spins and makes ATP. Ah, okay. The dam analogy helps. And this happens mainly in the mitochondria. Primarily, yes, through oxidative phosphorylation in the mitochondria. Electrons get passed down a chain of coating complexes, the respiratory chain. You might hear names like cytochrome C reductase and cytochrome C oxidase. As electrons move, protons get pumped, building that gradient to drive ATP synthesis. Okay, got it. Powerful stuff. Let's shift gears to the blueprint itself. DNA. How is that information copied and protected? It's central, obviously. DNA replication is the process of copying the double helix. It's incredibly accurate thanks to enzymes called DNA polymerases. And we already mentioned telomeres and telomerase dealing with the ends of chromosomes. But mistakes do happen and DNA gets damaged. So DNA repair mechanisms are constantly working. They're critical. Repairing mistakes, like typos. Kind of. Things like mismatch repair, fix errors made during replication. And a key player in responding to DNA damage is the P53 protein. It's often called the guardian of the genome. Guardian. Because if DNA damage is too severe, P53 can halt the cell cycle, preventing the cell from dividing with damaged DNA or even trigger programmed cell death. It's a crucial safeguard against cancer. Wow. Okay, so we have the DNA. It's copied. It's repaired. How does the cell actually use the information, the journey from gene to protein? Right. That's gene expression. It starts with transcription. That's where a segment of DNA, a gene, is copied into an RNA molecule. This is tightly controlled. Specific DNA sequences called promoters and enhancers act like switches, and transcription regulators bind to them to turn genes on or off or up or down. Like dimmer switches. Exactly. Then, that initial RNA molecule usually undergoes RNA processing. A key step is RNA splicing, where non-coding bits are cut out. And here's something amazing, alternative splicing. The cell can splice the RNA in different ways, meaning one gene can actually code for multiple different proteins. It hugely increases the coding potential. One gene, many proteins, that's efficient. Incredibly efficient. Then the finished RNA molecule moves out of the nucleus and finds a ribosome for translation. The ribosome reads the RNA sequence in three-letter words called codons. Molecules called tRNAs bring the corresponding amino acids and the ribosome links them together to build a protein chain. It's decoding the genetic code. It's mind-boggling the complexity, especially thinking about the diversity needed for, say, the immune system. You've hit on a key point. The immune system needs massive diversity to recognize potentially billions of different foreign molecules. Processes like VDJ recombination and junctional diversification achieve this. They literally cut and paste gene segments in developing immune cells to create unique antibody and T-cell receptor genes. It's like shuffling a genetic deck to create countless possibilities. Genetic shuffling, okay. And even things like mobile genetic elements or transposons, sometimes called jumping genes, have played a role over evolutionary time in shaping our genomes. Fascinating. Okay, let's zoom out a bit. 
Cells don't live in isolation, right? They talk to each other. How does that work? Absolutely. Cell communication is vital. Cells release extracellular signals, and other cells detect these using specific receptors. There are many types of receptors. G-protein-coupled receptors, GPCRs, are a huge family involved in sensing hormones, neurotransmitters, even light and smells. Receptor tyrosine kinases, RTKs, are often involved in growth signals. Cytokine receptors are key for immune communication. And some signals, like steroid hormones, can pass through the membrane and bind to nuclear receptors inside the cell. So the signal hits the receptor, then what? Then it triggers intracellular signaling pathways. Think of it like a chain reaction or a game of molecular dominoes inside the cell. These pathways often involve cascades of protein modifications like phosphorylation. You hear about things like MAP kinase modules or pathways using secondary messengers like cyclic AMP or CA2 plus N or involving NFKB proteins. And these pathways often have positive and negative feedback loops built in to amplify signals or shut them down appropriately. It allows for really fine-tuned responses. Feedback loops, keeping everything in balance. What about the ultimate regulation controlling when a cell divides? The cell cycle. The cell cycle is fundamental. It's the orderly sequence of events. The cell grows, copies its DNA, that's interphases, and then divides, mitosis. Mitosis itself has stages. Prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, where chromosomes condense, line up, separate, and new nuclei form. But this isn't just happening randomly. It's tightly regulated by the cell cycle control system. Key players are proteins called cyclins and enzymes called CD cakes, cyclin-dependent kinases. Their levels rise and fall, driving the cycle forward. And there are checks along the way. Crucially, yes, there are checkpoints. These are like quality control points. The system pauses to make sure DNA replication is complete, that DNA isn't damaged, that chromosomes are properly attached before they get pulled apart. If something's wrong, the cycle arrests until it's fixed. It's essential for preventing errors that could lead to things like cancer. So checkpoints prevent bad divisions. But sometimes cells need to die, right, for the good of the organism. Exactly. That's apoptosis, or programmed cell death. It's a highly controlled process, it's essential during development sculpting tissues, removing unneeded structures, and it's vital for eliminating damaged or infected cells. It involves a cascade of enzymes called cast bases that dismantle the cell from within. Often it's triggered by the intrinsic pathway, which involves the release of cytochrome C from the mitochondria signaling something is wrong. So apoptosis is tidy self-destruction. How is that different from just cell damage? That's necrosis. Necrosis is messy cell death, usually due to injury or infection. The cell swells and bursts, spilling its contents and causing inflammation. Apoptosis is clean and controlled. Packaging the cell remains for other cells to clear up without causing damage. Okay, clean versus messy. Got it. Now, this deep dive wouldn't be complete without talking about the immune system, our internal defense force. How does it first spot trouble? Let's start with innate immunity. This is the first line of defense, always ready and relatively nonspecific. Its cells have pattern recognition receptors, or PRRs. These recognize general microbial features called pathogen-associated molecular patterns, or PMPs. Think of things microbes have that our cells don't, like specific sugars, or bacterial lipopolysaccharide, LPS, or double-stranded viral RNA. So they recognize general danger signs. Exactly. Key PRRs include toll-like receptors, TLRs, and NOD-like receptors, NLRs. For example, TLR4 recognizes LPS on gram-negative bacteria. TLR3 sees double-stranded RNA from viruses. Yeah. TLR5 spots bacterial flagellum protein. TLR9 detects certain DNA patterns common in bacteria and viruses. When these PRRs are triggered, they activate immune cells like macrophages and neutrophils. The ones that do the eating. Phagocytosis. Right. They engulf pathogens. Neutrophils also unleash potent chemicals in a respiratory burst. And uh, dead neutrophils are a major component of pus. The complement system also plays a big role in innate immunity. It's a set of proteins in the blood that can get activated, leading to things like C3B coating pathogens, making them easier for phagocytes to grab, and also driving inflammation. Okay, so that's the immediate response. What about the more targeted memory-based defense, adaptive immunity? Right. This takes longer to develop, but is highly specific and provides long-lasting memory. It involves lymphocytes, B cells, and T cells, which develop in central lymphoid organs, bone marrow and thymus, and then circulate through peripheral ones like lymph nodes, waiting to encounter their specific target. B cells are responsible for making antibodies, or immunoglobulins. The incredible diversity comes from that VDJ recombination and junctional diversification we mentioned earlier. Billions of possibilities. E cells can also perform class switching, changing the type of antibody tail to suit the situation. 
Maybe one type is better for blood, another for mucosal surfaces. And T cells, how do they fit in? Yeah. T cells come in two main types relevant here. Cytotoxic T cells, which kill infected cells, and helper T cells, which orchestrate the overall adaptive response. They use T cell receptors, TCRs, to recognize foreign antigens. But, and this is key, they don't see the whole pathogen. They recognize small fragments, peptides, that are presented on the surface of other cells by MHC proteins. CD4 and CD8 molecules act as co-receptors, helping T cells interact with the right MHC molecules. MHC class 2 for CD4 helper T cells, MHC class I for CD8 cytotoxic T cells. It's a very precise recognition system. MHC presentation, like showing T cell a piece of the enemy. That's a good way to think of it. And during T cell development in the thymus, they undergo strict negative selection to eliminate self-reactive cells and positive selection to make sure they can interact with MHC properly. It's intense quality control. And all of this is the basis for how vaccines work, right? Absolutely. Vaccination works by presenting the adaptive immune system with harmless antigens from a pathogen, triggering an immune response and creating memory B and T cells. Often, vaccines include adjuvants, substances that help stimulate the innate immune system, providing that danger signal needed for a strong adaptive response. It basically tricks the system into thinking there's a real infection. We have different types. Whole microbe vaccines using weakened or killed pathogens, and newer nucleic acid vaccines using DNA or RNA that instructs our cells to make a viral protein like the COVID-19 SARS-CoV-2 spike protein vaccines. That rapid vaccine development was amazing. And it all connects to herd immunity, doesn't it? Protecting the whole community. It does. When enough people in a population are immune, usually through vaccination, it becomes very difficult for a disease to spread. This protects everyone, including those who can't be vaccinated. The example of measles vaccination rates dropping and outbreaks recurring really drives home how important high vaccine coverage is for preventing epidemics. It really shows how interconnected everything is, from molecules to public health. And these same principles are central to understanding diseases like cancer, too. Yes, fundamentally. Cancer arises from accumulated driver mutations in a cell's DNA, often affecting tumor suppressor genes like P53 or activating oncogenes like RAS. This leads to uncontrolled growth, evasion of cell death, and eventually the ability to spread metastasis. But understanding the specific molecular changes allows for targeted therapies. Immunological therapy, like blocking PD-1 receptors on T cells, unleashes the immune system against the cancer. Small molecule inhibitors like Gleevec target specific faulty proteins driving the cancer. It's incredible progress. Looking ahead, what excites you most in molecular biology? What's on the horizon? Well, stem cells remain hugely exciting. Their ability to become different cell types, whether pluripotent can become anything or multipotent, more limited, holds immense promise for regeneration. We see natural regeneration in places like our intestinal crypts, or dramatically in organisms like planarian worms, and the ability to create induced pluripotent stem cells, iPSCs, from adult cells, opens up amazing possibilities for studying diseases in a dish, testing drugs, and maybe one day generating tissues for transplants using organoids, these mini organs grown in the lab. Wow. Organoids, that sounds like science fiction becoming reality. We have covered so much ground today from the lipid bilayer, the organelles, energy production, DNA, gene expression, cell communication, the immune system, disease. It's truly staggering. So stepping back, what's the big takeaway for everyone listening? I think it's that everything your body does, every thought, every movement, fighting off infection, even diseases like cancer, it all boils down to these incredibly complex and beautifully orchestrated molecular interactions within and between your cells. Understand that this isn't just for scientists. It's fundamental to understanding health, disease, and the potential for future medicine. It's the bedrock of biology. Yeah, exactly. Just think about the elegance of a single cell, how it coordinates everything from fighting a virus to building you, the organism, all through these precise dynamic molecular dances. Makes you wonder, doesn't it? What other secrets are waiting to be uncovered as we continue these deep dives into life itself?